Good afternoon. It is now, I think, afternoon. And we're very pleased to see all of you and to welcome you here. And we know that it's a sunny Friday afternoon of a long weekend, so we're particularly grateful. And um, it's my great pleasure and honor to chair this uh, seminar on growth, employment, and poverty in India uh, from a gender perspective. Um, I think the underlying or overarching concern that all of us, uh, the three of us, share is that, as we all know, uh, India has been growing, at least until recently, rapidly growing. Um, but employment growth has lagged way behind uh, GDP growth. And deep pockets of poverty persist, and inequality is growing. And I think my colleagues here would share um, my assumption, which is that employment is a key pathway to reducing income poverty, reducing inequality, and that employment is a key pathway to inclusive growth and to social inclusion. And a related assumption is that these gaps and challenges around employment and poverty and inequality are greater for women than for men in India. That being said, I do also think very strongly that there are whole communities, both men and women, at the bottom of the economic and social hierarchy in India that sometimes uh, the disadvantages are shared fairly equally <laughs> between uh, men and women. Um, so let me introduce our panelists. Um, Maitreyi Das um, is the lead social development specialist in the social development, is it division, unit, department? department. I never know the structure of the World Bank. Um, and she was formerly uh, an officer in the Indian Administrative Service, an IAS officer in the Maharashtra Cadre. And she's well known um, widely for her very, um, very careful, credible research, but also the way that she presents it in a compelling way, not only on India, but also more broadly. So it's a real delight to have her. She's coming back to Harvard. She's had previous avatars at Harvard. Um, and Shankar Ramaswamy is a postgraduate fellow at the South Asia Institute. And he got his BA in economics at Harvard. And so he's also back for a while. And he has his PhD in anthropology from University of Chicago. And he's working on a book, um, taking that dissertation and putting it into a book. And it's Souls, S-O-U-L-S, in the Kal Yug. And he'll explain all of that, the dark ages, the dark era, the politics and theologies of migrant workers in India. So in the seminar, Maitreyi is going to talk about some of the puzzles around female employment in India today. And then Shankar will bring us to the industrial hinterland of Delhi, the capital of India, and talk about what it means to be a migrant worker in that industrial hinterland. Um, but first, I thought I would take this opportunity just to set the context and share some of uh, my own work on employment in India, very briefly, I hope. The employment challenge in India has two faces. One is the quantity of employment, and the other is the quality. So in terms of the quantity, the employment growth rate, after liberalization in the early 1990s, during the 1990s, the employment growth rate averaged less than 2%. Per annum. It was around 1.7%. And then it picked up, and everyone was feeling better. From 2000 to 2005, it averaged around 2.5% employment growth rate. But then something happened, and there was a dramatic slowdown, um, especially for women um, post-2005, between 2005, 2009-10, so much so that the Planning Commission and others asked the statisticians to go back out and do another round of the labor force survey to make sure that it wasn't just a statistical artifact, this huge decline. Um, 
Unemployment in India has been growing faster than employment has been growing in India. So unemployment is a major challenge, especially among young people and especially among young women, more so than among young men. Um, but I would venture <laughs> that underemployment in the informal economy is the real main concern for India. Um, around 94% of the workforce in India is employed in what's called the informal economy, where um, earnings and productivity tend to be low, work hours tend to be long, and so that is a characteristic of underemployment. There's also, and this gets to the quality of employment, there's been a shift in the employment structure in India. There's been a decline in wage employment and um, an increase in self-employment. And wages have been stagnating, and we know that the self-employed are primarily on the low end. They're not the high-end dynamic entrepreneurs who hire others. They're the own account operators or unpaid contributing family workers who um, don't hire workers. Um, so we have today in India over half of the workforce is self-employed. Uh, nearly 95% is employed in the informal economy. Um, so there are some real concerns. <laughs> some real concerns in the employment challenge of India. Let me just share some recent findings from work on urban employment in India, and then I'll turn over to our panelists. So if you think about urban employment in modern India, you'd think that's where you'd have all the formal employment. Well, 80% of all urban workers in India today are in the informal economy. Many of them are in manufacturing, and we'll hear about that from Shankar. Uh, a good share are in construction and in transport. But one third of all urban workers in modern India come from the four occupational groups that the um, Global Research Policy Network I coordinate focuses on, and that's domestic workers, home-based producers, um, street vendors, and waste pickers. So in modern India's cities today, one in three workers is either a domestic worker, a home-based producer, and both of those are primarily but uh, women, more so domestic work than home-based, or they're a street vendor or a waste picker. And our concern of this network <coughs> that I coordinate is that urban regulations, urban policies, urban practices in the best of times was pretty hostile to the urban informal workforce and their livelihoods. And now with urban renewal, the last 10, 15 years with urban renewal and these large urban infrastructure schemes, there's literally an urban juggernaut. It's not a figurative expression. It's an urban juggernaut that's undermining these livelihoods of one-third of the urban workforce. So if you're a domestic worker and you're evicted from your home, the distance to your employer's home becomes even greater, and nobody has thought that maybe you don't work a full day and you need a bus back in the middle of the day, or maybe you work in three employers' homes and the transport is not there. If you're a home-based producer and you're evicted, your home is your workplace. So you're at a distance from where you sell your goods or you get your raw materials. And um, you don't have the basic infrastructure services to make your home a productive workplace. If you're a street vendor, you face daily harassments, confiscations of goods, and increasingly these um, evictions from natural markets where street vendors have vended for centuries. Take Ahmedabad city, 80,000 street vendors, 30,000 are going to be evicted under the current urban renewal scheme. 10,000 have already been evicted. Uh, and waste pickers, they're the ones who collect and sort waste and recycle what is recyclable. They reclaim the recyclable waste. If you privatize solid waste management, suddenly they have no role their associations and their cooperatives are not entitled to bid for the solid waste management contract 
and they have less access to the waste that's the source of their livelihood. So our premise is that if you reduced all of these risks and insecurities, you would not only reduce poverty, but you'd increase their productivity and you would contribute to growth. So that's how we see the linkages between growth, employment, and poverty. So I turn to my tray. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marty, and, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to try and limit myself to 15 minutes. It's always a challenge for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm determined to, to, to meet that. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is a bit more narrow than what Marty's broad brush and introduction um, is. And, and it's not about growth, and it's not necessarily about poverty, but it is about employment. And it's about employment. It's not even about gender in employment. It's specifically about women's employment. And the reason I call it preliminary reflections um, is because it's at this moment, just before the elections in India, it's really political. And everything that I'm about to say, I've said at, at different forums, and get severely attacked from one side or another. And there are some very interesting coalitions that are being built around this particular issue that I'm, I'm about to talk about, uh, sort of um, unexpected coalitions that kind of come together. And I, you know, at a later point, I can talk a little bit about those coalitions. Um, but this is a, it's a fairly serious, to my mind, um, trend in India that, that, is, uh, that should be of concern to, to several of us. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the background to this work is that I'd actually started working on this about 15 years ago, and working specifically with the National Sample Survey data. And that's the, the preeminent data set. That's uh, the National Sample Survey does these huge, thick rounds every five years, and then does annual rounds. It has a specific module on employment and unemployment. And I've been sort of looking at the raw data now for, um, for 15 years um, over time. So have kind of got to know the NSS on first name terms, not in the same way as Marty, who has been quite the advocate in making sure that certain questions show up in the NSS um, and so women's employment gets counted. I'm assuming that uh, this is a sophisticated audience and you know all of the issues that are related to under undercounting of women's work and, uh, and some of those statistical issues, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, this is going to be much more of a broad brush. Here are the trends. What do we make of them? So the big trend that we are seeing now with the new data from 2011 is that participation rates, so labor force participation rates for women, have declined by nearly 13 percentage points from a peak, which was, which was a really low peak for a country of, of, of India's um, sort of growth trajectory, of a peak of about 45 percent to now 32 percent. And I'm only talking about 25 to 55 year olds which in a sense excludes students and early retirees. Because, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I do that, but this is a fairly significant decline over a period of about seven years. And the peak of 2004 sort of coincided with fairly dramatic growth rates. And there was quite a bit of a bonhomie in India where people actually started to think, well, maybe it's not jobless growth after all. Um, and as I've just said, this is highly political. Every, um, and, and as Marty said, the NSS was asked to go back and take a look at the numbers because people didn't believe them. Um, there are op-eds almost every day about how the NSS is undercounting or is mismeasuring or is leaving out the top decile or the bottom decile or something or the other. So it is really super political. It's also tied up, um, regardless of election year, it's tied up with this on, ongoing buzz in, in India on social inclusion, inclusive growth. And in the bank as well, at the World Bank, we have now uh, a new goal of shared prosperity. And I'm going to make a plug for this new book that we've just come out with on social inclusion, which is sort of much more global and, and much more um, than just employment. So just to give you a sense of why I'm a bit tentative, unless I'm absolutely sure that I'm, the trends that I'm seeing are actually the trends that I'm seeing. So what are the big messages? And sorry for this somewhat busy slide. Um, the big messages are that women are exiting the labor market, especially since 2004. Now, when you, when you look at uh, labor force participation, typically you're looking at uh, 15 to 64 years. In some cases, 15 to 59 years. Um, so we're in, in the NSS, you sort of look at 15 to, to 59. And the good news here is that a lot of the 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds and the 17-year-olds are just staying much longer in school. 
So education enrollment, um, let's not talk about quality of education, but in just pure educational enrollment has really increased dramatically in India. And that's a really good story of educational enrollment. So a lot of people who would otherwise say they're working in X or Y are now saying we're students. And to a very large extent, that's why labor force participation for women seems to be declining. But let's take students out of this equation. And in the past, we've done this as well. I mean, we have an old um, paper from 2003, which I've done with Sonal Desai, where we basically take a look at um, 25 to 55 year olds. So I'm going to stick with that 25 to 55 year olds, where we actually exclude students. What do we see? We actually see what I showed you in the last slide. The decline stays. The decline is much more pronounced in rural areas. But it's a really nuanced story. So it's not an all bad, hideous, horrible story. Um, the good news here is that women are getting out of manual work. So what's, what's really happening is that um, girls who get educated even up to eighth grade or, or, or ninth grade, and if they can afford to, they're not going to go back into agriculture or to doing manual work. The chances that a girl who is educated um, up to eighth grade is probably going to marry a guy who is educated a little bit higher than that because that's fairly typical for India. And if he's educated for a, a bit higher than that, chances are he's not a manual worker. So she can probably afford to stay home um, if she doesn't find uh, employment that's commensurate to the kinds of skills that she's acquired or she thinks she's acquired. So the good news is, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sure, ahead. Um, sure. Just a quick question because I'm not familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, does, when you talk about the labor market, is it just the formal labor market? No. Mm -hmm. No, it is. The question that I'm, I'm looking at is, what did you do for the major part of the last 365 days? So it does not include subsidiary employment. It includes only what's called usual status. In some places, it's called primary status, but it's usual principal status employment. Um, so it could be unpaid workers, it could be anybody. The NSS doesn't actually distinguish between formal and informal, um, and, and uh, probably because informal is the majority of the, of the population. I mean, regular salaried work is, is no more than 10% of the population, so 90% um, by, uh, are, are in what are, what's called informal. But um, so they basically get out of manual work. Um, the large proportion of women and men in India have been, as Marty said, in self-employment. And that's historically been the case. They've been in self-employment and primarily in agriculture. So it remains a primarily agricultural economy and people employment tends to be primarily in agriculture, self-employed. That's sort of the uh, you know, your own homestead, small land holdings, um, you're an agriculturist, that's essentially what you do. Now, if you happen to get a little bit of education, chances are you're not going to want to do that. Um, this is something we looked at in 2002, 2003, where we found a very interesting pattern for India. And that pattern actually holds out in, in Pakistan. Um, to a lesser extent in Bangladesh, but it's a very South Asian pattern, is that education lowers the probability of labor force participation for women. Across the board, education lowers that, that probability. And, and we, have a, we have a paper that actually goes into why that may be the case. We tried to see whether that was happening in, um, in the current uh, two rounds of the NSS, which is 2009 and 2011. Absolutely. Education continues to lower the probability of women participating even more so today than it did in 1993. So the, what I'm increasingly starting to call it is an educational penalty. Um, so there is an educational penalty for labor force participation for women, and that penalty is actually deepening. And what's um, a little bit more worrisome, and, and there are ways of explaining this, is that this education penalty tends to hit educated, rural, Dalit, and Adivasi women more than it does others. And I am going to talk a little bit more about that. This is kind of, here's the big picture. And then, you know, there, there's a lot of conversation in India about, oh, well, this is an income effect. Um, women are choosing to stay home because of an income effect. So what we actually do is take a look at husband's characteristics to try and predict what's going on with married women's uh, workforce participation. And married women's workforce particip participation is pretty much all women's labor force participation because women tend to get married by age 16. Median age in marriage still continues to be extremely low. So, I mean, that's pretty much everyone's married. 
Um, so those are the big messages. This is just a cross tab. I mean, at the, this is at the bivariate level. We've done a whole bunch of multivariate level analyses, which I'm not going to bore you with, uh, with coefficients of those. This, in a sense, really captures what's going on over time. So the first set of bars is people with no education. Uh, second set of bars is those that have had primary education. Third set of bars is those with secondary education, so grade six to about grade 10. And then post-secondary is everyone beyond grade 10. So, and on the left is the rural, on the right is urban. Very, very distinct labor markets. I hardly ever lump them together. So this is rural and urban, and NSS has a large enough sample size that you don't, even if you don't lump them together, you're in good shape. So this is for 25 to 50, go ahead. What's the definition of a penalty? <laughs> okay, so, so penalty is essentially the extent to which um, your labor force, the probability of your labor force <coughs> participation um, uh, lowering with the level of education you have. And it's essentially the education dummies. So the way we code education is not as a continuous variable. We actually code it as, 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 um, um, as sort of categorical variables. And um, the edu so there is no penalty if you're uneducated. Uh, chances are you're going to be employed. Uh, with primary education, chances are probably you're going to be uh, employed, but the, uh, the, the size of the coefficient decreases. It's still, it's still significant. With secondary, it starts to decrease. And with post-secondary, it's much lower. So that's, that's the penalty of being educated. It's a very strong word. It always it gets people um, worked up. I'm, but sorry. the penalty here is only in the post-secondary. Yes. The rest of them are all yes. Here it is, uh, and I can. Yes, it, it, the penalty is in post-secondary. Um, but what's also interesting is that the probability of being employed at the bivariate level, right here, is actually declining over time, for both urban and rural areas. So if you take a look at post-secondary in 1983, um, 60 60 percent of of women in rural areas were employed, uh, w even with post-secondary education. Admittedly, there were very few of them with post-secondary education in, in um, 83, and there are more of them now, but um, there has been a, a fairly significant decline if between 1983 and now in the probability of women being employed if they have post-secondary education. Um, I, I can't do this presentation without addressing the elephant in the room. And, and, and Marty knows this. There have been op-eds ad, nause, ad nauseum over the last several, um, last couple of years, actually, trashing the NSS data. Um, the NSS is the only data set in India. India is a remarkably data scarce environment. And NSS is the only broad survey that allows you to measure um, employment in any meaningful way. Um, we have tons of surveys in India. Um, measurement of work and of employment trends is abysmal. So this is what we have. We have the NSS. And, um, and there, have been, there have been huge attempts in trying to refine the NSS. And I believe, I do actually believe, that there is an undercounting of women's work in the NSS. There, there, there is an undercounting. But that undercounting hasn't changed over time. It's the same undercounting that when the NSS started, the definition of economic activity or the definition of being employed has not changed over time. Various things have changed, coding has changed, but, but it's the same definition. And by that definition, there has been a decline. Um, a good friend of mine, Swaminathan Ayer, writes um, at length about uh, it not capturing the upper the, you know, the top decile, not capturing the top 1%. Well, we truncate the top 1%. We get them out. Um, and, and it's still, OK, yes, it doesn't capture the top 1% of, um, of, of the Indian uh, elite of elites. I mean, I don't remember ever uh, an NSS investigator ever knocking at my door. So yes, chances are, you know, it doesn't capture it. Um, it's a problem. There's lots of non-response rate is pretty high. Yes, agreed. Um, sample sizes are small. I don't necessarily agree that they're small. Yes, so then you'll say, what you'll say is that it's not representative for x or y. Okay, so the level of representative strength maybe goes down. Um, a more problematic issue that has taken place over the last two rounds is that the NSS in its glorious wisdom changed the coding for, um, it basically changed the national occupation, national classification of occupations and of industry. I'm not going there. 
I'm not analyzing the, the, uh, the occupational structure right now. I've done that in previous rounds. I'm not doing that at round, uh, uh, for this presentation. This is just about employment rates and labor force participation. Um, interestingly, and this is, this is the, the peculiar coalitions that are coming together, feminist groups and apologists of the government are coming together in trashing the NSS. Feminist groups are saying this is undercounting. This is this doesn't make, this makes no sense at all. Um, you are undervaluing women women's work, and um, people who are coming who are sort of the the very very strongly committed to India's growth are saying the NSS is trash. It's not capturing X, Y, and Z. So it's a very interesting alliance that that's taking place. I don't think they quite realize it's an alliance, but it is. Um, but there are other stuff. So. Having said that the NS, uh, India is remarkably data, data scarce, which it is, there is a new uh, data now that, yeah, there's a new data set now which actually shows pretty much very similar trends. How does the literature explain this? So why, why are Indian women, Pakistani women, Bangladeshi women, less likely to be em employed than women in East Asia, uh, than their East Asian counterparts? Why do they look so much like Middle Eastern women and not like Malaysian women or Indonesian women? Well. Some people say it's cultural norms of status and of seclusion, you know. I don't have to work. My wife does not need to work. It's, it's an assertion of social mobility. It is seclusion. Um, women don't want to go out. I don't necessarily believe that because the same, and, and I can go into that, that's a whole other conversation and we can probably have that, um, have that later. Um, there is the, the human capital theorists, which basically say, you know, women have low attachment to the labor market. They don't get attached to the labor market. They don't carry it through. They have kids. They have reproductive re responsibilities. They exit the labor force. And then there's a third group that says, well, actually, there are a whole bunch of other issues involved, including the fact that it's not safe for them to go out, that hiring managers have got implicit and explicit biases, that there is discrimination in the labor, labor market, which is very difficult to put your finger on. It's difficult to say what's discrimination and what's not. And you can do you know, decompositions out of everywhere. You still won't be able to prove that there's discrimination unless you do different kinds of experimental studies, which are increasingly being done now. So what happens? Okay, th this is something that I thought we, we would be um, interesting to, to say, uh, to, to uh, dwell on for the next one and a half minutes. What happens if you bring a husband into the picture? Well, it turns out married women are less likely to be, in, uh, to be employed in India. If you control for husband's characteristics, so husband's education, the kind of work the husband does, it, it brings down the probability of female labor force participation even more. Yet, if you control for husband's education and his type of work, Women with post-secondary education become more likely to work. And that's an interesting conundrum that we're only seeing in these current rounds. I have a theory about it. I actually think that there is, there's, it's a network effect. There's something going on there about women whose husbands are in decent employment actually have access to a, the kind of network that women whose husbands don't have employment don't have. But again, um, for another time, Mm, it, it's still something that I'm developing about what may be happening. What's more worrisome is um, a complex, it's a complex pattern for Dalit and Adivasi women. So by and large, both Dalit women and Adivasi women, which is sort of um, uh, the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe women, uh, tend to be more likely to be, to be um, employed than other women. Essentially, these are women who are most likely to be uneducated, most likely to, to be the poorest, most likely to be in manual labor, most likely, if they're Dalit, not to have land. All of those drive employment of pretty much of the most menial kind. So if they can, they basically can't afford to stay home. And, and so they work. So their labor force participation rates are extremely high. But what we try to do is to take a look at what happens if they're educated. Now, education for Dalit and Adivasi women, particularly for Dalit women, has expanded fairly dramatically as it has for Dalit men over the last 20 years. There's been a huge expansion. But if you multiply the effects of being Dalit for women, of being Dalit and of having post-secondary education, there's a hugely depressing effect on their labor force participation. So we were seeing this for Dalit men earlier, we're now beginning to see this for Dalit women. And we are seeing it hugely for Adivasi women. So, and this penalty 
um, is much higher in rural areas. So what I think is going on is that there's a huge supply, huge compared to previously, um, supply of middle educated Dalit women and Adivasi women who are now entering the rural space and there are no avenues for them to be employed, even fewer avenues for them to be employed than there are for non-Dalit, non-Adivasi women. So that's um, many unanswered questions around wages. I think I don't think we can make any definitive statements about what's going on with these trends unless we take a look at what's happening with real wages. What's happening with quality of education? Yes, they're educated. What's the quality of education? What's their skill? Who's going to hire them? Um, what's the quality of jobs? What are, the, what are the kinds of jobs that they would agree to doing? Um, what are hiring practices? What are social norms both within the family as well as within the workplace? What are their aspirations? And safety and security. Would you take a job if you were a rural woman that made you go 10 miles away um, even if it was a decent job, you would really weigh the costs and benefits of that. So it's difficult to come, come up off the bat with policy recommendations just because this is a serious issue that needs a little bit more investigation. And that's exactly what um, we're planning to do next. So hopefully in the next couple of months, stay tuned. I'm a Twitter rookie, but here's where, who, else, who I am. There's a new... Um, uh, online conversation that we have ongoing, uh, please engage. And here's the plug for the book if you want to read other stuff for globally. Thank you. Thank you, Maitre. As I said, um, she can talk about data in a compelling way and bring it right to the women and right to the politics, and uh, has presented the puzzle and challenge extremely well. Thank you. Now this is moving over to Shankar. Right. Uh, okay. Well, thanks very much. My presentation is a bit different. It's based on sort of long-term field work in the industrial area of Delhi, um, the metal working industry in export factories. And I'm, uh, I'm focused on migrant workers, mostly from uh, states of Uttarancha, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Jharkhand. I'm just going to say some words about the nature of the work uh, and sort of the valences and possibilities of caste and gender relations that at least I've observed in this particular factory where I did my work. And then finally ask a few questions about the idea of social inclusion. So I have a, a bit of text uh, to, to read and um, hopefully will not take too long. So 15 minutes, right? Uh, Okay, so caste, <laughs> caste, labor, and the city. My research focuses on the lives and struggles of migrant workers working in a metal polishing factory, B156, located in the Okla industrial area in southeast Delhi. The factory began functioning in 2001 as a unit of an export company with American and Indian directors, established in the 90s. The unit was engaged in polishing of high-end steel artware for export to an American company for sale in department stores, galleries, and boutiques. The factory employed up to 60 workers who were male migrants, mostly from the states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Jharkhand, aged in their late teens to mid-40s, comprising backward and scheduled castes, Adivasis, and Muslims. Uh, just a note here, uh, because I know Matri has done a lot of work on exclusion and discrimination in the labor market that uh, I did not see actually um, barriers to entry on grounds of caste or religion into this kind of work. Workers often got into this kind of job uh, through other workers. Uh, that's, uh, that, was, that was the main way people come in. And that's also the main way pe uh, new workers are recruited. 
uh, though there was not by much by way of vertical mobility for any of the workers. It was tough enough to just hold on to jobs, much less move up, though many were trying to do that. Steel polishing is dirty, difficult, and dangerous work, entailing a fusion of brute force and fine artistry. Workers polished metal pieces using cutting, fiber, and cloth buffs over 9, 12, and 17-hour shifts. They were blackened through the course of the day by metal dust, buff fibers, and debris of compounds used in the polishing process. Workers were paid minimum wages, or less, of approximately $2.50 for an eight-hour workday, along with overtime payments at less than legal rates. They wore tattered work clothes, used second-hand sari fragments as face masks, and bathed in a single-person latrine and adjoining chamber. Polishers developed thick calluses on the hands, incurred injuries to the wrists, arms, and face, and suffered from chronic colds, fever, stomach disorders, and tuberculosis. They resided with other male migrants, wives, and children in rooms, shanties, and small houses in southeast Delhi, Faridabad in Haryana, and Noida, Uttar Pradesh. So uh, I want to talk a bit now about the ambiguity of caste in the factory. At B156, caste identities were often ambiguous. Some workers used their caste titles in the factory, such as Gupta or Yadav. Chero Adivasis from Jharkhand used the title Singh. Many did not use titles, giving rise to questions and suspicions that they might be scheduled caste workers. Those who took interest in caste identities might make inquiries about one another's caste, directly or indirectly, through others who might be knowing the person's relatives in other factories because one comes to know people in the metal polishing line. So you might not be able to ask a person, but you know the caste of their, of their, of their uh, relative cousin, um, so you can infer. Uh, direct responses were not always believed, especially when persons claimed to be, say, Yadavs, but did not use the title on documents such as state health insurance cards. But out of respect, and due to the absence of a means of verification, workers might accept persons' claims about their caste identities. <clears throat> in discussions away from the factory, workers might guess, speculate, and argue about the possible caste identities of absent others based on direct responses, information about relatives' caste identities, and observed behavior in the factory, such as cleanliness, attitudes towards authority, and actions during struggles. This ambiguity plays out in practices of distancing and intermixing. Backward caste workers and adivasis might wish to distance themselves from close contact with possible scheduled caste workers, but might not be able to easily do so in the factory. It's a very small place. In eating circles at lunchtime, one could see many groupings and sharing practices. Some would try to cluster in closed circles with their own caste or kin group, and within these groupings would eat freely from each other's containers. This was also observed when Muslim workers would sit together. At another end, one could see circles of persons of backward castes, scheduled castes, adivasis, and Muslims sitting close and eating together. In these circles, persons might take out their vegetable items before beginning to eat and place them on the inverted lids of others' containers to avoid saliva transfers. This is especially true when exchanging food between Hindu and Muslim workers, given possible aversions to eating practices in Muslim homes. During tea breaks, workers would cl cluster in close, mixed circles and drink from the same set of cups brought from the nearby dhava, the street-side eatery, because you cannot control that. All, they all are coming from one place. In the evenings, they might gather in mixed circles in dhavas or in residences and eat meals and drink liquor without complaint or difficulty. However, one also saw limits to intermixing. The Muslim manager asked Rajpal, the sweeper of a scheduled caste, who worked at B156 and other factories in the mornings to use a separate glass for drinking water and tea while he was at the factory due to pressures from workers, that is, workers both Hindu and Muslim. They otherwise had friendly and solidaristic dealings with Rajpal and even brought him into their union, and he complied with the request. While backward caste and Adivasi workers might have wished to maintain a distance from scheduled caste and Muslim workers in eating, drinking, and bathing, they realized that this is difficult to do in the city. In the industrial area, where persons of multiple castes work, joke, eat, drink, and live together in close, ambiguous proximity, workers admit that they must adjust to the mahal, the context, the atmosphere of the factory, 
the neighborhood, and the city more generally. If not out of choice, this is done out of the majburi, the compelling difficulty of surviving in the city. Now, friendships. Kin and caste groups are not only vital in the city for providing migrants with access to residential arrangements, training, jobs, credit, and assistance during illness. They also give migrants circles of sociality in neighborhoods, where they cluster together in small rooms, speak and joke in one's native language, and eat and drink together. In these circles, there might be shared bonds from the village, but also new friendships which develop and flourish in the city in the course of working and living together in close proximity. A worker's strongest friendships might arise within his own kin or caste group, as one observed amongst the Chero Adivasis. But over time, one witnessed other new friendships across lines of caste, regional origin, and religion among the B156 workers. These friendships could develop within the context of groups which formed at the factory. Within these groups, friendships could flourish amidst persisting ambiguity and apparent indifference towards one another's caste. Where there were good dealings, understanding, and thalmail, meaning synchrony, as one polisher put it, one does not think about inquiring into one another's caste or jati. Yet the, yet the ignorance of one another's caste could also create awkward moments, as when two workers, Naresh and Mitalesh, who had been close friends for two years, were walking home, and Naresh and Adivasari joked with derogatory language that scheduled castes were now infiltrating the factory in large numbers, without knowing that Mitalesh was also scheduled caste. I was the researcher, so I happened to know these things. Uh, Mithilesh laughed along heartily, perhaps not wanting to damage their friendship, though he might not have liked the derogatory language. So there is ambiguity, distancing, intermixing, and friendship. All of these possibilities are there. Now I want to turn to some reflections on gender and work. First of all, I want to say that one finds amongst these workers a work, uh, what one might call a working class masculinity, um, a sense of one being the sole breadwinner, an opposition to women working, uh, uh, one's wives working, and so on, which Matt has already talked about, especially in factories. And this is very interesting because uh, it's almost as if they want to protect their women from people like themselves. However, women are widely visible in Okla export factories. And there, is, there are feelings of competition and attitude, certain attitudes to the, towards the possible sexual character of such women who work in export factories. Now, in the metal factory, uh, they were, these were almost all male workers, though, though there was for a time um, uh, a, a female worker who worked as a helper in, the, in packing, but that did not last long because it started to destabilize some of the relations in the factory. But male workers... Uh, admit that, worker, that women are actually seen doing this kind of metal polish work in other parts of, say, Uttar Pradesh, where you might be having your own workshops, family-run business and things. Women can do the work, actually, they will say. They've seen them doing the polish work. It's not that this is men's work. And as I say, women in, in, in larger factories, you will see women coming into the metal line as helpers to do packing and other kinds of work. A few of the metal workers in this factory also had the, their, their wives were working in garment factories. And there was a recognition amongst the workers that it provides much needed extra income, especially in times of lockouts, closures, and agitations when wage payments would be delayed or discontinued. And there could actually be a kind of, you know, simultaneously a disapproval of, of, of uh, women working as well as a jealousy for those workers with working wives. What one also saw, and this was perhaps more uh, approved of amongst male workers, was home-based work. For example, fine embroidery, putting embellishments on, 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 on women's clothes for contractors. And that was widely visible in neighborhoods. Uh, it's more permissible because it's done at home, and it could be very valuable also in tough times. But it's low paid, and it's very difficult work. It's piece rate work. And uh, you would have to do this work, like if you were living in a rented accommodation, one room, <coughs> one bulb, you'd have to be doing this work sometimes into the late night to meet an order. And you could see, at least one of the neighbors, neighborhoods I was working in, that the eyesight of the women progressively deteriorated from this kind of work. 
of fine embroidery into the night. And you also have to contend with hassles from the landlords who do not like to see this excess you know, electricity expenditure. That's all your sort of what you are doing there. The contractor is not paying for that. So these are some of the problems. But um, you, saw, you, see, you saw a lot of this, and, you, and I think it's a growing sector. But I must also note here that <coughs> even in the absence of paid work for women, right, the majority of cases I observe, uh, the uh, absence of paid work for workers' wives, the, the domestic activities that they are involved in, the cooking, the cleaning, looking after the children, managing expenses, which is a lot of mental work, uh, and the supportive presence of wives can be quite crucial for male workers to be able to work and survive at all in factories, and w especially when one is struggling in and out of work and trying to get work. So that is very important, I think. Now, I want to just tell one uh, story here about uh, a sense of the possibilities that developed, okay, uh, which is having to do with, well, some, some things come to light in this, uh, in this experience. So what we have is in 2005, there was a legal dispute between the American and Indian directors of this company. So this led to a work stoppage, delayed wages, and while the majority director set up a new factory in the industrial area, okay, so the majority director sets up a new factory under a new company name and resumes production with workers from the old company as well as new hires. So the union um, in, the old, uh, in, in B156 of those workers files legal complaints in the state labor department office. And this is a repeated pro process. Every month this was happening. So on the way back from the labor office on one occasion, two workers who were on a bicycle got hit by a car. Both suffered injuries and one died. His name was Ramdev. So following this, there were agitations by the union and some of the workers were also involved in this. Not all, but uh, the unionized workers involved in this agitation for compensation and employment in the new factory for Ramdev's widow whose name was Shibo Devi, who had been living in the village in Madhubani district of Bihar with her small children. I'm very glad uh, Marty Chen is here because she has a very deep understanding of the lives and worlds of widows in rural India. So interestingly, Ramdev's relatives and caste mates who were working in the new factory opposed the idea of a job for Shibo Devi, saying that our women in Bihar don't do nokri. They didn't work, they don't do employment, they don't work outside of the home. Mm -hmm. So there were these jostling forces. The B156 workers eventually began a series of protests, street protests in Delhi, to agitate for work and the payment of wages from the directors, which went on for months in the winter of 2005. And they urged Shibo Devi to not just take a modest compensation and, and go back to the village, but to fight for a job, a livelihood, a means of supporting a family. And this was, so despite the pressures from her husband's own caste mates, Shibo Devi eventually joined these protests. And this was, this was incredible because it meant that she was the sole woman among all of these men, standing with placards for hours on the roads of Delhi. These protests received some media attention and eventually grew into a global grassroots boycott of the company's goods. The struggle had a very good ending with the B156 workers along with Shibo Devi getting permanent jobs in the new company factory. And Shibo Devi is still working there today. So all of this is going on among the working class. Precarity, low wage work, resistance to women working, yet recognizing the obvious advantages of a second income, and under certain conditions, urging a woman, Shibo Devi, to join their struggle and fight for work. So I will just conclude with, uh, I want to say just one, a few words about inclusion and then just show you a couple of images. So the idea of inclusion, which I guess, uh, which has come up in Matria's uh, uh, slides, uh, the question for many of us, of course, is inclusion into what? Into this kind of precarious, low-wage, hazardous employment? Uh, uh, one is not, of course, uh, for exclusion, uh, but it is tough to actively desire that more men and women get into these kind of jobs, which are ironically some of the better jobs on offer in the industrial area. There's a chance that you will get minimum wages and uh, health insurance and provident fund. So this is problematic in the urban picture. 
And uh, as we know from the rural employment uh, situation, that's also a very bleak scenario. But it's still where migrants want to return. They want to return to their home villages. And I found this to be the case across castes. And it's why they are working so hard, sometimes self-destructively so, to accumulate earnings in the city. Um, the idea of accumulating savings and s setting up a kind of small business to be an alternative source of income to agriculture, because people don't want to necessarily get into, do, get into that too much, though they have to do that too. So they too are asking, if they do return, uh, what will they do there? Will it be less difficult and less precarious than what we're doing in the city? So it's difficult to know the answers to these questions, right? As Matthias slide, many unanswered questions for them as well, which is why migrants tend to linger in the city, though they may never quite feel at home there. I'm just going to now show you a few images, and we will be done. Can can uh, uh, just turn down the light? Uh, no? Okay, this is the Oakland industrial area, the shop floor. This is tea break, where as you see, there is a great uh, there are all kinds of groups. There's fluidity, uh, uh, including with the management. Uh, the smiling person in the back is the supervisor. Eating circles. So this is an Adivasi Muslim scheduled caste worker and another scheduled caste worker. Not a, yes. So. Within uh, circles of uh, friendship, you can have sort of these kind of eating in from one another's containers and so on, which is a sign of closeness and perhaps indifference to caste. Bathing with one another, you know, very impossible, very difficult to have any space for oneself. You have to mix with everyone, including soap, including, you know, scrubbing and so on. This is Mithilesh and Naresh, very, you know, very good friends, as I say, but uh, unaware of one another's uh, caste. This is Ram Dev after the accident, bicycle accident in which he, uh, he passed away. Agitations at the gate for employment. And then this very interesting nonviolent, silent street protests that occurred in 2005. This is, a, this is, again, more of the placard protests at the railway siding at the Oakland Industrial Area. And during this time, we had, again, so much importance for what women are doing in the family. I mean, many, many men sent their wives home if they were there or did not bring them because they were not getting wages. But for those who had women in the home, it was really important to, to look after so many things. though relations were not always good. There was a lot of argument. This woman on the right, this, this was one of the few women who were working in the garment factories, and she was actually saying, uh, pressuring her husband to leave the struggle and, uh, because nothing, she felt nothing would come of it. That was how she felt for some time. This is Shibo Devi who joined the protests, as you can see, sitting with the placards on the open road. Okay, that's it. Thank you. As promised, um, amazingly vivid, fine-grained presentation and brings out that intersection of caste and gender and the ambiguity of all of that. Just for those who are not familiar with the Indian caste hierarchy, 
which is hierarchical but also very complex. There's the higher castes, and then there's what's called the other backward castes, and then there's the scheduled castes, also known as Dalits, and the scheduled tribes, the Adivasis. And as you can see, there was a tension between the two groups at the very bottom, which is often what I find in my work, is that the ones who impose caste are often really the ones at the bottom where they get a little um, status by imposing caste on others. And just to say that I think the presentation also shows that when you're on the margins of formality and informality, I mean, these workers in one sense were formal, but the work was dirty, dangerous, and difficult. And um, there was some, they, were un they had a union and other. So it's not just that 95% of the workforce is informal. It's also that some of the formal work is dirty, dangerous, and difficult. So we'll open it up for questions. And I think maybe we'll take groups of three questions and then uh, another group. So we're opening it up. Everyone is stunned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I just had an observation. Um, most of the first presentation is about the interaction of the education sector. <coughs> but Shankar's uh, uh, description is somewhat silent on the education sector. Really Can you education. speak just a little louder? Because I think there's no variation in education across the board. So the question is, is that true? There's no variation, and so there's that your insights have very little to say to the statistics of this group. It's just a question for both of you. Anyone else? Should we start with, uh, yes? I guess uh, I, it's also on the same lines of clarification. When you, Mike Ray, talked about <coughs> participation of, uh, of women, are, are you looking at um, in, in, you're looking at employment or and or self-employment or just so much more uh, formal no, just all, 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 all any any unpaid employment okay. <coughs> yes uh, when you are looking at uh, unemployment data across India and across common employment sectors are there cases or regions where we can spot positive deviance cases and which we can learn from? Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, we'll take one more and then have a cluster of four questions. <laughs> so this question might not actually, you may not be able to answer because it's kind of an imperative question. Um, and I wonder, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking of the um, Mexico mm -hmm. and how you know, there's incredibly safety concerns along those bus routes that people take, that women take to go work in factories and come home. And I'm just wondering if you see similar kind of education work, education employment trends in, in other parts of the world outside South Asia. So in places where there are other similar factors with safety concerns or um, stigma against women working. So question on oh, yes. education. Uh, Tarun, I, I, when it comes to the, I had more information on the men, uh, is quite widely varied education. You had people who are completely uh, uneducated, never went to school, uh, and people who were BA fail, up to BA fail, in the same factory working side by side. And uh, this was part of also the discussions amongst workers is actually, you know, did they, were they right to stay in school? Should they have actually, a lot of regrets about, I should have finished 10th, I should have made it to 12th, I should have gotten through the BA. Regrets about finishing or about not finishing? Both things. Uh, One is, what is what, what have I done here because I'm working next to people who are anguta cha. Yeah. At the same time, maybe I just, maybe if I'd stuck it out more, I could have escaped this. Like there's some kind of imagined threshold that you have to get over in order to get into, say, a supervisory job. But then they could see that the supervisors they, did, they were not b better educated, actually. And uh, uh, so there's, um, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, ambiguity about the value of education to workers. Women, of course, were generally less educated, and it did not require a great deal of education to get in at the bottom layers of, the, say, the garment industry. But uh, education matters some in other very important ways, not only amongst the working class, because those who can read and write become very important when it comes to for example, workers, uh, when they come together to try to uh, address difficulties 
in the in, in the company, the ability to read management documents, to the ability to write Hindi properly in a letter, the, re the ability to compose a letter of grievance. These things uh, were great assets and were not, unfortunately, uh, uh, available amongst all workers. But whoever had it, it became very important. Yeah, I think um, I would actually just add to what Shankar is saying. There is a, and you probably already know this, um, there's a very strong discourse in India currently about um, quality of education and about skills. And um, it just seems as though uh, the entire gamut from, say, primary educated to secondary of some kind is kind of lumped together uh, just because uh, quality varies so dramatically, and somebody who is a tenth fail may look very similar to someone who is a fifth pass in another in another place. So I mean, that's um, just to to come come back to yes, there are um, regions where there are where there's a lot more happening. So typically, western states and southern states. Um, these are states where which have grown um, very very dramatically. So um, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Karnataka, all the southern states. Uh, these are also areas where there is um, much less control on women's mobility. Um, it, these are states that tend to be safer as well. There is a historical tradition of women working um, as there isn't in states that have a culture of seclusion. So, um, but I don't think it's the seclusion that's driving it. I think it is opportunity that's driving it. So there's definitely greater opportunity in those states. Uh, interestingly enough, the Northeast, um, which has a, a tradition of women's mobility and, and much fewer controls on, on women in general, doesn't have the opportunity. It, nothing's happening really in the Northeast, and you see that you actually see, which is what makes me really think that this is not about seclusion, it is about opportunity. So, so yes, there is, there is the, the regional. So actually, someone was calling it a education penalty, but also a location penalty. But uh, it's a, um, So on the maquiladora specifically, um, so Mexico has labor force participation rates that are far higher than, um, than South Asia. Um, and we actually don't see similar patterns to South Asia in any other region except the Middle East. There's no region in the world that has it. And if regions in the world did have such low labor force participation, so the United States prior to World War II looked a little bit like South Asia looks now. But, um, but the, uh, so female labor force participation. No, I was going to say the striking thing is that, uh, that the men put it down. Yeah, yeah, it, it's that that wasn't the case. I mean, basically, it's um, it was with men leaving um, for the war, a and male wages um, declining in the United States that actually led to female uh, and, and the cultural rhetoric or the uh, around women's place being in the home was very similar. It, it looked very similar at the time, and then fairly dramatically that changed, and there was just this influx of women into the, into the labor force. Um, we don't see these patterns anywhere else. And in fact, in East Asia that had similar similar profiles um, prior to, say, the 70s, uh, picked up uh, female employment very dramatically. And in fact, there was an explicit policy to draw more women into the work workforce uh, that there wasn't in, in South Asia. Is, am I missing something? Um, no, I, but, so, I just had a... I know you've presented bivariate um, analyses, but I was wondering if you would see this much more in, among older women. And the logic I was thinking of was that as, as their kids become actually much more white collar, uh, et cetera, they don't want their mothers to work. Um, is, I'm basing this on anecdotal evidence, but I've seen that up, has happen over and over again especially in the urban areas, not so much in the rural areas, would you, do you think that, uh, so, and, and that might also explain the, the fact that high, more higher educated husbands and high, high, highly educated wives are likely to have highly educated kids who would move up the, the economic ladder and then, so 
to force their uh, mother, not force, ask their mothers to not, not be doing any further work. I mean, it's um, very difficult to actually test that empirically, um, but I think that that could very well be what's happening. What we do see is that um, having a child in the home under the age of five hugely depresses women's labor force participation. We would have thought that living in an extended family would enable women to leave. Um, but that's not, we're not finding that. We're finding that larger families, extended families, um, are not enabling women to leave. So there's definitely a childcare um, issue here, um, just they're not being but childcare. But um, I don't know. There is, there's a very strong thread that thinks that um, social mobility uh, leads to increasing demands on women to stay home as a as a status um, uh, assertion of status. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that 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 ambivalence is something that Shankar definitely it captured. Is that you know, on the one hand, you really don't want to ex expose your. There's this whole paternalistic idea of not letting your woman out. On the other hand. There is a status associated with a woman working, and there's an income associated with a woman working. So there's there is that ambivalence, um, and this is much more from you know the, the work that that's coming out of the qualitative um, side. That we, yeah. So I, I think that it's it's possible. I was just thinking it would also probably explain the overtime increase in that in the education penalty in that age group as there as those women who are who were educated early on as their kids become more and more educated, they're moving up the labor force. Yeah, it's it's possible. I mean, it's completely possible what you're saying. My sense is that there's actually a huge supply of sort of basic education, educated women, and there just aren't opportunities to absorb that, and more in rural areas than in urban areas. Yes. Um, actually, to that point, do you think that I actually found the idea of the education penalty very interesting? Um, I've seen some. Uh, parts of this in uh, my work in India as well. I was wondering, you mentioned that uh, you saw that the education penalty for women was higher in rural areas. Um, and you, you're correlating that to opportunity. But in, do you see a very significant difference in urban areas? Yeah. And why do you think that is? Do you think there are just fewer jobs. I mean, I, the rural economy was, is a, um, an agricultural economy. Uh, Non-farm employment has increased over time, but nowhere near uh, being uh, of the of, of the kind of um, magnitude as the agricultural economy. And and agricultural work is of two kinds: you're either you're either self-employed agriculturist or you're a casual worker. Um, in both cases, you're seeing withdrawal of women from both casual work as well as from um, uh, self-employment and agriculture. So what are the kinds of jobs? I mean, if you if you think about uh, a village, what, what are the kinds of jobs that are available for people with some education? It's either public sector jobs. So essentially, you're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're a, you know, you're a clerk, you're a, uh, there, there are certain kinds of middle, lower level public sector jobs that are, that are available. Um, or there are um, there's manufacturing, and we know that that's not what's driving employment in India. It's not manufacturing. Services, to a large extent, are, but those services aren't located in rural areas. Just a two-pointer on the self-employment in agriculture. A lot of it for women is unpaid contributing yes. family workers. Yes. So you get educated, and then you become an unpaid family worker. It's not where you want to end up. Okay. Um, actually, where I was going with my question was more I know you said that you don't want to sort of give policy recommendations on this, but what is your sense? You mentioned that it could be a location gap as well, but what would be your sense on how this education penalty can be overcome? Are you saying that if you can get girls to finish high school, uh, it will make them more employable and they are likely to, mi uh, to migrate to urban areas and hence be more employable? Or are you saying that if there is like a particular threshold? In which if they don't cross, much to what Shankar was saying, that if there's a particular threshold that they don't cross, and consequently they're totally unemployable in either the public sector or in the agricultural sector. I think that's pretty much what I think is happening, that, that um, uh, there is a threshold, and that threshold um, becomes higher where education quality is lower. 
So in areas where you know that you can get a 10th pass certificate, which means absolutely nothing, uh, the chances are that that threshold then becomes uh, an, an undergraduate degree. Whereas in areas where you know that the education system is, is reasonable and an eighth pass is really an eighth pass, chances are that threshold is, is lower. In, so, in, yeah. in Ahmedabad city, that, at least my work, the tenth past was the real threshold. Yeah. And for the manufacturing workers in the old city, looking at retail jobs low end in the new city, you had to have tenth class, right? But they also compared what you earn at the at the entry level in the tenth class retail job, and it was what they were sort of earning here, and they they really didn't think in terms of career, so they there was. So there's actually a question um, that actually asks women that don't, um, that are not employed, what they would like to do. There's an aspirations question in this. Um, and uh, I haven't looked at it in current rounds, but in previous rounds, there hasn't been much change, I, actually. Um, one third of them want to be working. And of that one third, no, three quarters of them want to be working when they're not. And of the three quarters, one third wants to do um, regular part-time work. So they want job security, but flexible um, times, hours. Um, and so, uh, which is it? I mean, the Indian labor market is not set up for that. Um, A, Indian labor market isn't set up for, for regular protected work, and B, it isn't set up for flexible work. And the growing occupation, I think, in, in urban India, is for women is domestic work, right? So then that's the question, becoming huge. And the question is whether these women want to do that, or you know whether they're aspiring higher. Yes. <laughs> I wonder, with the massive online education availability, Harvard is one of those schools that is providing that, MIT. If there is any difference in the level of entering into the market because of that free education that's available in these days. My sense is that's capturing the minutest, the tiniest, minutest um, part of the top 0.001 percent of the. Yeah, um, yeah uh, that's but my the fact sense. That you can't use education as a reliable signal of some, some sort of skill the way you can in here, right? Like I passed college. Everyone who's past college has some sort of basic skills that you know, eyes require to understand. That might be a reason why, I mean, that itself is a barrier to entry. So I invested all this time into my education. I went to a class woman, but nobody knows what that actually means. So. But it buys you other things. It buys you the kinds of things that Shankar is talking about. It buys you, number one, for women, and especially in, in Bangladesh, we actually see this empirically, it buys you a better marriage. Um, so you don't get married to a manual laborer, which means you don't do manual work. So if it, it buys you status, it buys you a better marriage. It buys you um, a better life because of who, oh, well, a better life, who knows what that is, but, but yes, it, so it's the externalities that are non-direct non non income externalities are um, certainly there. And, and as Shankar is pointing out, this, this whole idea of someone who can read, someone who can, um, it, it, it just, the girl in the family that comes in that can read, as opposed, she, she, she just acquires, and for young women, that's a hugely empowering thing to, to have. Yes, the back. Uh, in the rural area, these, this education penalty that you're talking about, um, these women, are they also suffering from a decrease in the standard of living as opposed to what they had before when they started getting educated? Uh, and at the end of this, is their standard of living or their poverty factor increasing because they are not getting jobs? No, poverty is declining very dramatically. 
Um, so that so, means their standard of living has still gone up? So when we're talking about standard of living, we're talking about the household. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, what happens within the household is a whole other dynamic. But overall, there is a huge mobility of households that are exiting poverty. So, yeah, I don't think their standard of living is, is declining. And that's, that's what people say is the income effect. The other question is if, if education is not getting them the work or the jobs that they want, is it something else in the rural area, uh, for example, a certain skill set after a basic level of education, for example, if they get primary education and after that they go to a trained vocational school for, say, example, the embroidery or uh, the, the weaving class or something, would that be more in that uh, beneficial to them? This is Marty's area. <laughs> I mean, it could be, um, but it's not easy to create that niche without support, right? Um, taking up self-employment in setting up self-employment employment is, is not really is not hard. easy. Um, it's really hard. Yeah. One of the the areas where I've, I've been very happily proved wrong is uh, uh, one of the worries that we had in looking at this depressing effect of education on labor, labor force participation was that I said, well, why would people want to get educated if you're not, I mean, Rakeen's question, like, why would you want to, like, what's, it, what's this buying me? Why would I go through 10 years or 12 years of schooling? Uh, or if I don't see that for my younger sister or my sister-in-law, daughter yes you can see it probably but for a younger girl in the family I would just tell that girl you know don't bother just uh, that's not happening people are staying in education Um, so very happy to be proved wrong there yes Uh, you were mentioning vertical mobility in those factories did you see in that very low do you see any examples of vertical mobility among the factory workers in your time there Well, um, not in, sorry, not in terms of, okay, you, you did see uh, a lot of mobility occurs from the, sta- from the post of helper to skilled worker. Helpers, like unskilled, and helpers are generally, in, they don't want to stay helpers uh, uh, for very long. They want to learn. It's not so easy to learn. To get on, because to get, you have to get onto a machine, you have to have someone help you, things like that, have to have someone teaching you, but that, that kind of mobility you can see over time. And actually, uh, so that can work to the benefit of, of, the, of uh, you know, that's how everyone gets in, becomes a skilled worker by going through this. So there is some degree of mobility in that. Um, from the skilled worker to the lower levels of management was, I did not see, almost, I mean, there's just no room. You, 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 know, uh, uh, you have one person who's a sort of supervisor of a whole shift and as long as that person is there, you, you're never going to move up from that. And people realize that. So the issue was, can you just get higher wages even? Higher wages here meant, can you get minimum wages? You know, which, are, which, are, which are being revi- you know, which are, uh, revised according to dearness allowance and occasionally revised um, beyond dearness allowance. But to get that implemented is very difficult. Does that result in a sense of hopelessness among the skilled workers that that's kind of, once they have reached that point, that's pretty much it? No, no, I won't say that. Uh, not hopelessness. Uh, uh, difficulties, despair, tensions, but a lot of struggles. So you, the fact that people are always trying to get a little bit ahead somehow, either in that job, so trying to get, trying to agitate maybe for better wages. It could mean working, working in the daytime here or even overtime here and in the nighttime working somewhere else. That's also going on. It could mean getting a, if you're doing you know, metal working, by day, but also buying a buying a, a, a sewing machine and trying to learn that because you might want to switch lines. And, and as I said, also thinking about uh, amassing some capital and starting some small business back home. That is a lot of what is going on in the head. Uh, but it's very difficult to uh, to actually progress towards that because you're also immersed in um, all these debt relations too while you're in the city. You know. Uh, uh, getting into 
various kinds of savings, savings committee groups and um, loans, repaying this, repaying that. I mean, you, don't, you might not actually take home much of your wage packet every month. But uh, institutionally, the, I should also say that when it comes to the mobility, the factory cannot really run unless there is the promise of mobility that has to, that's always being put in front of you, that you work well, you will be rewarded with what's called you know, tarakki, promotion, advancement. That's always in the mind, and that has to always keep management always trying to give you that sense that that can happen. But uh, when it, it, the problems occur when that mobility is not mm -hmm. visible. So that is when you, you start getting more problems. But the, that's the task of getting workers to work, is to constantly create the sense that, that uh, our prosperity will be also your prosperity. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate very, very much your presentations because it really given us the tremendous complexities of the Indian society. For example, um, I think you captured that complexity and that specificity, historical, social, and otherwise of the uh, Indian society. When you talk about, you created this, this concept of education penalty. That is just the opposite of the paradigm that is used here. Education within the Western paradigm provides you for mobility, yes, yes. for many good things in the society. So when I see educational penalty in your conceptualization, I can help it but realize that we are, in a way, trying to analyze a society with the methodology and the epistemology of a different kind of society. And in that sense, I believe that we are not getting the real picture. So in your case, I think it's, it's more specific. And what impresses me is that the labor place, in a way, is trying to um, smooth the caste system because it is in the working place where the workers try to adapt and to overcome the differences between the caste. But the education penalty certainly is the epitome of a society very complex, very uh, different from the society that we have here. So if you could help me understand that. <laughs> Thank you for that <laughs> encapsulation. Any other questions? Yes. I just had a question for Shankar. Uh, when you're talking about labor families and uh, upward mobility of them, uh, can you shed some light on the families of such uh, labor uh, class where do you see children often break the, the mobility cycle, you know, the poverty cycle go out? Because in my experience, I've worked in Rajasthan in rural India, and children of lower costs get still get treated as um, in, some, in some schools, in some parts. Well, I just say very, very quickly, that's a very important question, and I'm afraid I will have to work very long to, because because these workers were not that, uh, they were fairly young, 20s, 30s, and they're small children. It's hard to say what, they're, what they'll be. You know? but He's got a lifelong project. <laughs> I'll just say this, that uh, uh, I found some, it's, it's again what Matthew was talking about, quality of schooling now, uh, which is often seen, right, as path to mobility and things, but 
I've seen many cases of uh, where the person does goes through goes through the schooling, even maybe goes through college, and then when the family moves back to the village, they also go back to the village with them. Even if they've been working in a decent job in the city, they might not have that attraction to the city. Secondly, I, I found something very, I mean, this is something I didn't understand, but uh, given all what we say about urban education and all that, is that I found workers sending their children home to the village of Eastern UP, for example, for their schooling, because they felt it was not so good in the city. They weren't being attended to in the municipal corporation development public schools. They just were not being taught. And in the village, they'll be taught at least. So sending them home, sending for the schooling there. And what trajectory they take after that, I don't know. I, we'll have to see. But it is not, uh, it's, not, a, it's, not it's, a, it's a complicated picture. Well, the time is up. I'd like to ask Maitre and Shankar just to each say one concluding thought. You've spoken a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, yeah. thanks a lot. Nothing. Okay. Um, <laughs> <not> Ambiguity. <laughs> no? Yeah, I don't really have a sum summing up of the situation. Okay. Well, my, my, I'm sitting here between the, <laughs> the urban worker that is, the hope is to go home, and the rural worker that's not finding the work in the rural areas. And the fact that India truly has a major conundrum and challenge because what's available, what's growing in India growth-wise is the high-end IT. And you have to have high school in English and it's just a whole different quality of education to reap that benefit. India is not known for the big manufacturing middle like China. It does have the factories clearly, but it doesn't have a lot of them, right? And then there's a lot of low-end service jobs, right? Oh, okay. And, um, and I think, you know, we, it is a paradigm issue because the paradigm from the global north was also that you grow the economy and all good things happen. Well, India has grown the economy, and all good things have not happened for uh, the broad base of its society. And I just think we have to pay more attention to employment at the demand end, at the supply end, at the institutional middle. Um, so we'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank there you. is one small point. Oh, is that, small point. That, yeah. you know, there is a, a group that actually feels that this is this is the, the classic U shape of female employment. That is, the U hasn't turned. Um, to, to me, it's looking a little bit like a V. I mean, you hit rock bottom and then something may happen. But um, it, it could very well be that the U hasn't turned. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>